Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, how could we? Um, These ears are quite old now. When, <laughs> <laughs> when we have um, very strong patterns, uh, I think that we have one way is we can deal directly with the pattern, and the second way that we can build the new patterns, and the third way that we can use the old pattern to do something new. <laughs> Which way do you prefer? What's wrong with all three? <laughs> <laughs> it just takes a very long time. <laughs> if you hold an idea in your mind that it will be a long time, then it will be a long time. If you hold an idea in your mind that it will be a short time, perhaps it will be a short time. But if you don't make long time and short time, then you can use those three right where you are. Could you explain a little more about the comma? Karma. K-A-R-M-A. No, not, not karma. Oh. I think the, uh, the things that you were recognizing as you were meditating about your, your self. No, that's what she, she was talking about, karma. Oh, karma. Karma. Karma means action and reaction, okay. and action that has some intention behind it. If you do something that has some intention behind it, it leaves some kind of imprinting on your deeper mind. In Western terms, your unconscious, Buddhist uh, the psychology is called a storehouse consciousness, uh, some place that holds and saves all of the various impressions that we have made through action and intention. So uh, we become habituated to particular kinds of uh, ways of relating based on our habit formation. And if you don't perceive that, then it pulls you around by the nose, so to speak. But if you perceive that, then little by little, you can not get caught following that to the same degree, and sometimes completely cut that off or cut off your uh, identification or attachment to that and let it go or in some cases use it differently as she was saying. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, part of uh, practice uh, is paying attention and recognizing uh, our uh, thoughts and emotions as they arise and the pull that they have on our behavior and being able to uh, see that clearly and cut through. So, uh, in the Mahayana Buddhist tradition uh, there is a recitation called the Four Great Vows. And uh, in our Zen centers, we always repeat them early in the morning, first thing. And uh, the Four Great Vows say, sentient beings are numberless. I vow to save them. Delusions are endless. I vow to cut through them. Teachings are infinite, I vow to learn. <coughs> and the Buddha way is inconceivable, I vow to attain. So the second vow says, delusions are endless, I vow to cut through them. So, uh, as the previous questioner was saying, that could take a long time. If 
your delusions are endless and you're vowing to cut through them, that's infinite time. But time is a construct like any other idea in our minds. Sometimes we're engrossed in something and an hour feels like a split second. Other times uh, we're bored or we're tortured in some way and a short time feels like a long, long time. So uh, delusions are endless. I vow to cut through them. It means moment by moment perceive how you're deluding yourself and cut through. Now, the fundamental way we delude ourselves is by making subject versus object. Inside versus outside. We make a division there. And that's a delusion. Things are not actually that way. There is no independent subject and independent object. They inter are. There's no inside discrete from outside. They touch each other, they permeate each other. It's hard to say where inside ends and outside begins. And you could say the same thing with almost anything. So the fundamental delusion is making subject versus object. Making two where there fundamentally is not two. You can't even say one. Because the last great vow says the Buddha way is inconceivable. If you say it's one, you already have made a conception. So to perceive how we are making that division and how it is influencing the way we interface with the world that we're embedded in uh, is to cut through infinite delusions, moment by moment by moment. So, uh, karma is that making. Uh, when, when Zen Master Sung San uh, first came to this country, uh, and his English was extremely limited, uh, he would teach with very short aphorisms, using the vocabulary that he had at his disposal. And one of his aphorisms, both for formal meditation and for meditation and action, was don't make anything, don't hold anything, don't attach to anything. So uh, we're always making something, uh, and it's not in accordance with fundamental reality. And when we make something, we then begin to hold it. That's where we get caught with our own concepts uh, and opinions and ideas. And as we hold that more and more, we get attached to it. Uh, there was a, a Zap Japanese Zen master, Uchiyama Roshi. Uh, they gathered together a group of his talks. And the title of the book was called Opening the Hand of Thought. So this grasping quality, this holding and attaching to what we're constructing and fabricating, uh, we need to perceive that and open the hand of thought, let go. So uh, there is a, you could say, a prior step to don't make anything. Because we're always making something. So uh, you can't just say, don't make anything. It's like uh, spraying uh, some kind of perfume on a rug that's mildew. You cover it over, but you haven't dealt with uh, the, the basic uh, mildew. So the prior step to, to making something is perceive what you are making. Cut through that at that moment that you perceive. Let go. Open the hand of thought. If you can do that over and over and over again, uh, 
then some of those things that we make, you can form a different relationship to and use differently. So that's essentially what she was talking about.